How about that music this morning, church? And if that does not get you in the season for Christmas, I don't know what will. That was an amazing time of worship this morning. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you so much, band. Absolutely beautiful this morning. Well, people get ready. That is the title of the sermon that I have been working on. And it comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. We begin the Advent season with the story of Zechariah in the temple. And I'm going to be reading it from the message. I'm just going to read you the story all the way through. It is a way for us to remember how we begin this season with anticipation and waiting. During the rule of King Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest assigned service in the regiment of Abijah. His name was Zechariah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Together they lived honorably before God, careful in keeping to the ways of the commandments and enjoying a clear conscience before God. But they were childless because Elizabeth could never conceive, and now they were quite old. It so happened that as Zechariah was carrying out his priestly duties before God, working the shift assigned to his regiment, it came his one turn in life to enter the sanctuary of God and burn incense. The congregation was gathered and praying outside the temple at the hour of the incense offering. Unannounced, an angel of God appeared just to the right of the altar of incense, and Zechariah was paralyzed in fear. But the angel reassured him, Don't fear, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Elizabeth, your wife, will bear a son by you. You are to name him John. You're going to leap like a gazelle for joy, and not only you, many will delight in his birth. He'll achieve great stature with God. He'll drink neither wine nor beer. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit from the moment he leaves his mother's womb. He will turn many sons and daughters of Israel back to their God. He will herald God's arrival in the style and strength of Elijah, soften the hearts of parents to children, and kindle devout understanding among hardened skeptics. He'll get the people ready for God. Hear that again? He'll get the people ready for God. Zechariah said to the angel, Do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man, and my wife is an old woman. Joe, never call me that, okay? (laughs) But the angel said, I am Gabriel, the sentinel of God, sent especially to bring you this glad news. But because you won't believe me, you'll be unable to say a word until the day of your son's birth. Every word I've spoken to you will come true on time, God's time. Meanwhile, the congregation waiting for Zechariah was getting restless, wondering what was keeping him so long in the sanctuary. When he came out and couldn't speak, they knew he had seen a vision. He continued speechless and had to use sign language with the people. When the course of his priestly assignment was completed, he went back home. It wasn't long before his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Gospel writer of Luke. Main character, of course, is Jesus. But we do not hear about Jesus for at least 30 verses, and Jesus is not born until well into the story. But Luke is going to tell us of Mary's extraordinary pregnancy. He's going to tell us about this person that prepares our hearts and minds with another story. The story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and this pregnancy. The parents of John, or otherwise known as John the Baptist. John will prepare the way for the Messiah. John will tell the people to get ready to anticipate the long-awaited one, the Messiah, the one that they've been praying for. N.T. Wright, he's a scholar and pastor and theologian, I often like to read, quotes this. He says this in his commentary. John would fulfill the biblical promises that had spoken of God sending someone to prepare Israel for the coming divine visitation. And how does Zechariah hear this news of a son who he would name John? 
He has a visit from an angel. Wasn't that a TV show? Visit from, no, that was touched by an angel, wasn't it? Michael Landon. But last week we heard from the children a video that we did right here in house of our own kiddos telling us what they were thankful for. How many saw that video? I just loved that video. And let me tell you, um, it did not surprise me at all that donate, donuts made the cut. <laughs> I was like back there doing this. I was watching the video because when I go upstairs and I kind of make my way to the sanctuary in between services, the one thing that I have conversations about are the donuts. When I go around and I talk to the children, I'll say, did you get your favorite donut? Yeah. And I hear about it, church, when the pink sprinkles are gone. (laughs) I hear about it big time. Well, this week... You know, as I was, that was reflecting in my mind, that video, I was reading some things on the internet, and I thought you would enjoy this close to Christmas. These are some comments that children have made about angels. And so this is Gregory, age five. He says, I only know the names of two angels, Hark and Harold. <laughs> all of age nine says, everybody's got it all wrong. Angels don't wear halos anymore. I forget why, but scientists are working on it. Uh, Matthew, age nine, it's not easy to become an angel. First, you die. Then you go to heaven, and then there's still the flight training to go through, and then you have to wear to wear, agree to wear those angel clothes. <laughs> Mitchell, age seven, says angels work for God and watch over kids when God has to go and do something else. That makes sense, right? Um, here's one I like. Henry, age eight. My guardian angel helps me with math, but he's not much good at science. (laughs) But here's my favorite. Listen closely to this one. This is from Caitlin, age nine. My angel is my grandma who died last year. She got a big head start on helping me while she was still down here on earth. Oh, that touched my heart. That's the kind of grandma... Tessa, I want to be, (laughs) the kind who gets a big head start on being an angel by helping their grandkids right here on earth. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we come to you in hope today. Hope for your message in our hearts. Hope for good news. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart, O God, be filled with hope. May they be acceptable in your sight. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, my Lord and my Savior, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're in this sermon series. We're entitling Hark. And we'll look at the messengers of God, especially those that are leading up to the Christmas story, the ones who tell of good news. And sometimes the angels give a few warnings, but we're going to hear of these stories, these messengers. And what does the Bible say about angels? Do we know? Well, there are hundreds of biblical references to angels, so we know that they're a big part of God's story. Angels give words of hope through the prophets. Angels announce the arrival of the Messiah. That's the ones we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. Angels share the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember how the angels are in the tomb and they say he is not here, he is risen. Angels foretell of the second coming of Christ, and angels reveal the gospel to the Gentiles, and angels foretell God's final triumph. So the angels are throughout the whole biblical story. Now, first of all, the term angel is derived from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. That's what an angel is, a messenger. Now, there is a Hebrew word equivalent to that. That's Malik. And we think of the book of Malachi, which means the messenger. So, Angelos and Malik, meaning messenger. And when we read of a divine messenger, the story really is centered around the message, right? So, we focus more in on the message that the messenger is giving. And so, there's, we don't really get a clear picture of what an typical angel might look at look like do all angels have wings what do you think do all angels have wings certainly artwork over the centuries has depicted them this way but I'm not sure we get that picture from every part of the biblical story 
We don't hear of the angels having wings all the time. When I hear this, the story of the heavenly hosts of angels singing, I automatically think of them in the sky with wings, right? But then maybe that's just me. My mother has a large collection of angels. She collected angels for years. And so we have a whole curio cabinet in the corner of the lake house that has her angels. And guess what? All of them have what? Wings. Well, the prophet Isaiah, where do we get this from? The prophet Isaiah tells us of winged angels. And there are other references in the Bible that kind of depict wings. And yet, and yet... For all that the scriptures tell us about angels, as we study God's word, we soon get the feeling that God has been guarded in what he's revealing about angels. Everything in scripture says concerning angels that there's the connection, there's this connection to the main theme. There are no pages or passages whose central purpose is to spell out all there is to know about an angel. But in today's story, we hear of a certain angel, Gabriel connects us to the main theme of the one who is coming. The people need to get ready. He is the one who gives this divine message to Zechariah. And Zechariah has been chosen, it says in the scriptures, this is his one shot to be in the temple to light the incense for the people. And he is responsible then for the whole Jewish nation at this point. All of the prayers of the people have been piled onto Zechariah's shoulders. And he is bringing them into the temple. He is responsible for presenting the prayers of the people to God. Now then, this angel shows up. You know, Zechariah goes in with anticipation and expectation to be met by God. But when he does hear a word from God, what does he do? He reacts with fear and doubt, right? Gabriel said to Zagara, don't be afraid. Have you ever wondered that's the first thing that angels always say? When, when there's an angel in the story, the first words out of their my, mouth is, don't be afraid, because evidently the experience must be quite unsettling. And so... Zechariah said, Gabriel says to Zechariah, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call him John. Then the angel Gabriel went on to say all that John would do, that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit from the moment of his birth, and that he would bring many people to Christ. He, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, he said. Now, I've been reading this book, and part of it is because it kind of goes with our theme, but it's also because a friend of mine wrote it. Susan Robb, she's a pastor at Highland Park United Methodist Church down in Dallas, and I actually went to seminary with Susan, and she has written a book on the messengers of Christ, and she states this, <clears throat> as someone steeped in Israel's scripture, Zechariah would have known this was hardly the first time that God had acted graciously for childless couples. He knew the story of Abraham and Sarah to whom God had given a child in their old age. He had known the anguish of, Sa of Hannah, who was the object of taunting over her infertility and so distraught that she promised God that if he would give her a son, she would dedicate the boy to the Lord's service. And in particular, he would have known how these various figures reacted when faced with God's blessing. Do you remember how they react? Abraham falls on his face. Sarah laughs. And Hannah breaks into a song of thanksgiving. But what does Zechariah do? He responds with, well, I'm an old man, and my wife is no spring chicken either. I'm not so sure how this can happen. <laughs> Doubt and fear. You know God has to be frustrated with us, church. We get a little bit of good news, and so often we'll pour cold water on it immediately, right? How could that be? Oh my gosh, this is happening to me. How could that be? Well, <clears throat> let's just all agree that if an angel appears and they say, don't be afraid, let's just say thank you, okay? <laughs> let's just say thank you. 
Zechariah asked for a sign, and I always told my kids, be careful what you ask for. You ever told your kids that? Be careful what you ask for, because Zechariah gets a sign from Gabriel. He cannot speak a word. He says, you cannot utter a word until the child is born. That will be your sign. Now, I don't know what Elizabeth thought about this. She may have been saying, thank you, Gabriel. You know, I have some peace and quiet around my house. But think of it this way. The prayer had been answered, not just for Zechariah and Elizabeth, but for those waiting and anticipating from a message from God. They were outside the temple praying, waiting and anticipating, and yet Zechariah could not tell them that their prayer had been answered. He, the message was to get ready, and he couldn't go out those doors and say, Church, I just met an angel. The angel told me to get ready. The Christ, the Messiah, is coming. He, he could not say a word. He could not go out there and tell them that the beacon of God's grace, his own son, was going to turn hearts to the Lord. He couldn't tell them that the greatest gift was coming, their Lord and their Savior. So if you cannot tell people to get ready, verbally, how do you share good news, church? How do you do it? My mom and my grandma used to say this all the time when I was a little girl, growing up and as a teenager, especially when I was a teenager. (laughs) Terry Sue, actions speak louder than words. You ever heard that saying? Raise your hand if you've heard that saying. Okay, I always thought my grandma and my mom were so smart (laughs) that that came from them when I was a kid. But, you know, as I was doing a little research, I know it didn't come from them, but when I was doing a little research, it was interesting that this proverb goes all the way back to the 1550s. Michael de Montaigne, his exact words were, saying is one thing, And doing is another. And over a century later, it kind of changed with an Englishman named J. Pym who wrote a variation. He worded the proverb this way. A word spoken in season is like an apple of gold set in pictures of silver. And actions are more precious than words. And then another century passes and A.M. Davis penned another variation in 1736 when he said, actions speak louder than words and are more to be regarded. And then Mark Twain, our own Mark Twain, words it this way, "Action action speaks louder than words, but not nearly as often. All these forms of proverb illustrate a stark difference between the words of actions A difference between words and actions giving weight to what? Actions. The Bible has much to say about living out our faith and actions and words. And in Matthew 21, Jesus uses a story to illustrate how actions speak louder than words. Jesus' story is about two sons whose father told them to go and work in a vineyard. One said no, he would not go. And then later changed his mind, thought better of it, and said he would go and went on and worked. However, the one who said uh, that he would go didn't show up. Now then, which of the two sons did the will of the father? The son who said yes but did not follow through failed to love and honor his father. The Apostle John puts it this way, My little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Can our actions share good news? Absolutely. Can we get a head start here on earth, on earth as it is in heaven? Absolutely. We share good news Each and every time we live out in this faith, live this faith out in the world around us. Think of all the times that Jesus shared good news without even saying a word. When he touched the lepers and healed them. When he healed the sick, the blind, and the lame. When he fed the hungry. Each action 
Was God's love conveyed in ways of mercy and hope? Do you not have to have wings to be a messenger of God, church? All you have to have is God's love and grace filling you. You just have to be a willing to be that messenger of good news and step maybe into places that make you feel a little uncomfortable and share a bit of food or some warm clothing, a pair of gloves. Sometimes angels appear in such a way that it's hard to determine if it's human origin or divine origin. But we must remember, as those who follow Jesus Christ, the divine is always at work in and through messengers of hope, of peace, of love, and of joy. These are messengers that are getting a head start here on earth, church. This is the way we help people get ready. Is that they look at you and they see Christ. They see God's love in you. And if that doesn't get somebody ready, I don't know what does. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, thank you. Thank you for your love poured down upon us. Thank you for the way that you help us know that it's all in your time. Help us to be beacons, God, of your good news, beacons of light. Help us to be messengers, messengers in word and in deed. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's children said, amen.